Good evening. Um, I want to welcome in this webinar today, this evening, uh, um, distinguished guests who have agreed to take part in a series of webinars. And today is the first one on the um, reality in different regions of Africa dedicated to a report which I, as a rapporteur, uh, on the Africa. Committee of the European Parliament currently is working on. And this um, report uh, is. Je travaille à l'heure actuelle sur un, un rapport qui euh, façonnera les relations futures d'investissement et commercial entre l'UE et l'Afrique. Avec euh, mes collègues rapporteurs fictifs des autres partis politiques. Nous avons discuté et avant d'aboutir à une version finale, nous avons décidé d'écouter l'Afrique, d'écouter les Africains. Ce que vous avez à dire sur la forme que doivent prendre les relations. What we have to take on board by considering, and it is not by occasion that this webinar is just three weeks ahead of the EU Africa Summit in Paris, organized together uh, by the uh, European Union authorities and the African Union authorities, where we want to to raise challenges to the current and to the future problems, challenges, views on how to shape this. And therefore, I want to welcome in this hour today evening's webinar, uh, Dr. Peter Mutuku Matupi. He is the Secretary General of the East African Community. And I'm really happy that he agreed to be with us this evening. I want to welcome Dr. Isaac Shinyekwa, from the Economic Policy Research Center at the Makerere University. And I also want to warmly welcome Mrs. Jane Nalunga, Executive Director of the Southern and Eastern Africa Trade Information and Negotiations Institute, Seatini, well known maybe to a lot of participants in this um, webinar as well, from Uganda. So, um, That was the, the, the warm welcome to all of you. And um, I don't know exactly if uh, um, Honorable Dr. Peter Mutuku Matuki is already with us. I don't see him yet uh, in the webinar. So uh, let me introduce maybe some two, three theses and remarks um, from my point of view uh, from the European Parliament's International Trade Committee. Um, concerning the work we have to do, and maybe also I'm a member of the left group uh, in the European Parliament, uh, why we are considering it very important to have such a joint approach in drafting the report, and uh, by drafting a report, of course, to lay a basis for rethinking the trade relations between the European Union and African countries. Um, We are meeting in a very specific situation. We are all going through the pandemics of COVID-19. We are all affected in different ways, but um, we have already a fourth wave with the Omicron um, mutation of the um, coronavirus uh, spreading out uh, in a lot of European member states. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to adapt our ways of organizing the work. We have to adapt by organizing the, the family lives because parents have to stay at home if children can't go to the school. We have the closing of kindergarten. We have different issues here in Europe and probably the same situation or a similar situation. Um, our African uh, sister and brothers are uh, dealing with uh, in this regard in their current 
um, issue. And to be very clear, I guess fighting a pandemic needs joint, solidarity, um, common uh, approaches to fight the virus and to learn how we can live with the virus in future. What does it mean for us? Because this virus, the COVID-19 pandemic has a deep impact on the economies as well. Uh, let's see the closing down of borders, the, 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 the phase of how economies can recover. So that is a topic uh, in the WTO, it's a topic in the United Nations system, it is a topic probably of course also for the African Union as it is for the European Union. And here I think we have really a lot to do. Uh, I welcome now um, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Peter Mutuku Matuki is just with us. Sorry for having already started because we didn't know exactly when you are able in your um, uh, time um, to, to join us. So we are very happy to have you with us in this evening. I just informed that uh, we had from the European Parliament the task to draft a report about the um, um, trade and investment relations between the European Union and uh, the African Union, so in, in particular, of course, with the um, um, AFCFTA. And um, we want to elaborate today what are the experience, what are the problems, what are the views in the different regions in Africa. So we are starting with the East African community. So welcome, uh, Secretary General. Uh, and um, I have put to you already in written a, a question for giving you a certain guidance, what we expect from you this evening, um, a brief evaluation of the trade and investment relations between the EAC and EU at the current moment. What do you see, what do you expect, and what do you um, think went well, where are problems, what could be better? And knowing that, of course, the EPA is a complicated situation also, between um, uh, the EAC and the EU. And how does the EU, uh, EAC exchange uh, relate to the achievements for the African uh, CFTA? I think that could be for the beginning uh, a good occasion for you to give us a short briefing where we are. Floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening. I must apologize for for some uh, technical issues, but I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm now, I was with you, but I didn't have right, I couldn't speak, but I'm happy that uh, now I'm with you. So Mr. Scores, I want to thank you for first and foremost, uh, inviting us into this discussion as the East African community, and indeed all my colleagues, the panelists who are participating in this, and a very important uh, topic as we begin the new year, 2022, up in year to all of us. I would say right from the beginning that indeed uh, the theme of today's uh, meeting on whether Europe is in a listening mode, uh, I would rather from where I sit say, I think we should go beyond listening mode to action mode, because some of the things that we do as regional economic blocks could be East African community, could be European Union or African Union, we represent the people, we work for the people. Indeed, our own treaty establishing the East African community puts the people first. And all that we do, we do for the people of East Africa. And I know from where you sit, whatever you do in Europe, you do for the good for the people of, Euro of Europe. But just to go straight to the, to the, to the topic on, in terms of uh, where we are. I think we must, we must so appreciate that there's some lessons that we are learning from COVID pandemic, that world, the world and globe is one. One part of the world affected by a pandemic, it affects all of us. So the need to all of us act in a very coordinated manner as a world. And therefore, in fact, the whole saying that the world is a village, I think COVID came to tell us that the world is a village and therefore important that whatever we do, we do in a very coordinated manner. But uh, to thank you that uh, we, were, we were able to, to share in terms of the European Union and the East African community, the historical ties and where we have come from 
uh, and so forth, has obviously put uh, the relations between uh, East African community, this part of Africa and EU very closely. And the two regions, of course, have enjoyed, I would say, very cordial relations and working and in terms of trade, ETC, for, for quite some time. And that is actually as early as uh, even 1975. And I even uh, the, the, the relations that existed and, and that, that, that were there. But, but to say that uh, under the Lome Convention and the Cotonou Partnership Agreements, that indeed uh, brought some sort of um, structured way of dealing with one another, Europe and the rest of the world, SCP countries, ETC, it's defined on how countries in different parts of the world should relate. And that is why with the, with the, the Cotonou, the Lome Convention, that defined clearly now we are supposed to be doing. But we must appreciate because of circumstances, revisions on how we need to deal with have been done, the number of things because of global dynamics, things have changed. And I, at some point when the WTO members uh, contested the preferential uh, treatment of export from SP countries, at that time, I think the EU complied with the WTO rules and therefore came in now the issue of negotiating on reciprocity basis. And that brought in now the economic partnership agreements that have been there from 002 to date. And we must all appreciate that the countries, the SCP countries at the time, had enjoyed very preferential market access relative to with the EU, and that is something. But therefore, the East African community entered into negotiations with, uh, with EU and economic partnerships. And that started as early as 2004. And since then, this negotiation continued up to around 2014. But therefore, from where we sit as the East African community with six partner states, and for your information, we are soon having the RFC join the community as the seventh member. And that brings the block to a level that obviously in the, in the, in the global standing, we, we, we have to really participate actively. And therefore now we discuss, and therefore at some point, different partner states of the ESC categorize different. And therefore, because of that, you find implementation of paper as it were, may not have been that easy because we were categorized differently from where we sit. With some countries in East African community categorized, as uh, LDCs, while others categorize to sign this paper as a block, then met some challenges. But the treaty establishing the East African community geometry, the countries that are already in a certain arrangement may still proceed. And therefore, the summit of the heads of states of the ESC, uh, when they met in sometimes in February. Uh, last year, they agreed that uh, EPAS should proceed, the ESC should proceed with EPAS, but on the basis of variable geometry, meaning that the countries that are ready to proceed can proceed. And that is why Kenya took the step of proceeding. However, the, the initial thinking was that we should have actually entered into EPAS as a community. And therefore, in the process of this, that is, uh, obviously signed into the purpose. Kenya was able to ratify this at some point. And therefore trying to see how to build the capacity of the rest of the partner states and seeing where there are gaps so that we can allow them also join and all of us join as a, as a community. And therefore giving a bit of, back of, of background of that, this issue, a number of issues are still within uh, the purpose aware that East African community and EU in terms of how the trade profile and how it has been happening, that the ESC share with EU trade total volumes by 2020 was almost 0.2%, 0, 0 0.2%. 0 Exports uh, to the EU from the East African community were mainly coffee, cut flour, tea, tobacco, fish, vegetables, that providing for almost five Five, five, uh, you know, point seven in terms of million euros, which primary, which main, mainly uh, took for primary goods, accounting for about ninety-five point seven percent. 
while manufactured goods basically 3.5%. And the imports from the EU, um, from the EU into the region were mainly machinery and mechanical appliances. And that meant that primary goods accounted for 24.4%, while the manufactured goods accounted for about 71.4%. And that is to say, the, the two, Europe and Africa are critical and they, are, they, are, they need their strategic partners. And therefore some of these agreements that we enter into, we need and I agree need to be very people-centric. We need to see how do they support and promote the welfare of the people. Sometimes, you know, we may need to revise and see how do we enter into agreements that indeed uh, would be support, uh, would be win-win, uh, so to speak. And that is why I think in some of the areas we must appreciate, much has been done, much needs to be done. And I think from where we see it as East African community, we are still committed and I've seen some partner states making good progress in terms of how we want to enhance the ESC EU efforts. Therefore, that is to say, much that is a bit of history, but some, some issues we must appreciate went on well. And that is why I was saying that when you look at Article, our own Treaty 7, it provides for the variable geometry and therefore we can still relate with EU on the basis of who of the partners of the EAC is ready to proceed. So both parties, uh, we must appreciate, also both EU and EAC, demonstrated level of flexibility in the negotiations. Yes, EAC has been flexible, in its asymmetrical nature of the negotiation parties. At the same time, the EU did not penalize uh, Kenya when we were given the timelines and were not able to, to meet those timelines. And we must appreciate that, of course, the uh, flexibility has been very important in, in these processes. From where we see it as this African community, economic and development cooperation is, is, is critical, is core to us, and is provided. And we need to engage and possibly take this further to the next level. And that's why I'm saying we need to even be more inclusive, bring private sector on board, closer with the public and government, ensure that, of course, civil societies are also participating in some of these negotiations. So whatever arrangements we are taking to, clearly provided and informed by the principle of inclusivity. In terms of what could be better, I think we may need to see how do we strengthen, how do we ensure the EU, EU the EPAS is, is in terms of quality is improved. How do we strengthen? How do we give it a, a more, more, more vigor energy that what is done benefit the people? So perhaps I would say, that uh, we need to we need to relook into some of the realities and the uh, practical aspects as it were, and see how we could possibly strengthen our negotiations, so that then it can provide uh, to be win-win uh, as it were. So possibly from the EU side, considering to address the issues of the financial needs of the LDCs. Look at the fact that much is, of course, COVID hit the entire world, but most of the countries in Africa were, were badly hit because uh, largely they were depending on, uh, you know, the global supply chains. And therefore that affected, you know, that affected um, how we were getting supplies of, uh, you know, of the raw materials, ETC. But also the economies were not uh, supported at the same, you know, way in terms of uniformity. Some countries were able to, to provide some incentives while others didn't have, didn't have that capacity. Quite a number of people lost jobs, lost incomes, ETC. And therefore, how can EU demonstrate and create capacity to a private sector and even public sector in terms of recovery? Remember, even the issues of access to vaccine becomes and still a big challenge to Africa. And therefore, important that uh, whatever is happening in the EU, EU to be on the front line to support possibly the access of uh, COVID uh, vaccines, because that is one way that will be assured of uh, equal recovery. So we are still talking of, uh, an, in average, below 20% of 
in most of the countries in Africa, while the rest of the world could be above 80% in terms of vaccine. So I would say that uh, EU remains a very strategic uh, region for Africa and particularly for East Africa. And I think we may need to aware that now the African continent of free trade area provides an opportunity of over 1.3 billion in terms of market. How can Europe now position itself strategically partner with Africa so that now we can even see how to harness and, uh, you know, and, and, and build the capacity of the African continent as it were. I'm seeing from where we are as Africa, maybe the next, uh, you know, the next factory of the world will be Africa in terms of the raw materials, in terms of capacity. And therefore this partnership would be, this is the right time uh, for EU possibly to take advantage of this and closely work with uh, Africa and most of the regional economic blocks aware that um, the GDP that is coming around the CFTA is almost three, uh, three trillion US dollars. And this is something we cannot take for granted. Uh, SMEs, we need to build their capacity, achieve more economies of scale and improve farm level efficiency. And uh, also focusing on uh, specialization and industrialization with a greater focus on value addition, increased uh, local content and development, but also strategic partnership, where we see, we'd encourage to see more coming from Europe coming to Africa, taking advantage of the larger market. And therefore, to me, from where we sit, and going by the records, SCFTA will boost Africa, intra-Africa trade by 52.3%. Uh, once import duties and non-tariff barriers are eliminated. And I think uh, potentially Africa is the continent to watch. Africa is the continent you need to, 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 to talk to. And I think that's why I will say we move, we move beyond listening and action because the people now are, are so dynamic and are wait, they want to see what action are the governments and the regional economic blocks doing in terms of responding to the challenges that they are facing as a people. And therefore, I think we need to, we need to move fast. We may not have the luxury of time in terms of uh, getting a bit of testing, but we need to move fast because the people themselves whom we represent are moving and are expecting that we need to, to move with speed and uh, again see how do we even onboard the youth who are very energetic and we can take advantage of their skills understanding and also women how do we support uh, build the capacity of women particularly those who are doing a cross-border trade and with all this it becomes very easy that uh, that we need to relook at some of the trade agreements with view to strengthen them but also informed by the principle of inclusivity, so that we don't a sector of uh, you know of our population, etc. I thank you, and I think uh, possibly that could be the introduction in terms of how you look at it, and based on the on on, on the query that you asked me. But very exciting, and I want to congratulate you for indeed organizing this very timely you know workshop that, that talks about how we need to relate going forward. But let us now move from listening to action. There, I very much agree with you, Excellency, that we have to come from talking to action, to, to acting, that I fully agree. The question is in what direction, what issues we have to take on board. Uh, before I give the floor to our next panelist, I want to welcome uh, Barry Andrews in our uh, in our um, meeting in our webinar because he's following and he is the president of the SDG Alliance of the European Parliament. So uh, welcome, Andrew. Um, um, and um, we have also the former chair of the International Trade Committee with us, Helmut Markov, who is following this discussion, and we have also with us. Um, the, um, the pen, uh, representative of the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce, Wendell Eddy. So welcome to all of you and of course to all other participants. As you have seen already in the chat, you can raise questions directly to the panelists and uh, to, 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 to all participants. Uh, I can only 
but encouraged to take part in the debate. A lot of questions are on the table, obviously, even after your introductory remarks. Um, Excellency Dr. Matuki, and I would now, before I give a first question, which has already uh, put uh, in the chat to you, um, the, the floor to Dr. Isaac Shinyekwa. He is from the Economic Policy Research Center at Makerere University. So another eight minutes to you so that we have enough time really for the discussion. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I indeed appreciate uh, being given an opportunity to share my views about this. Um, and uh, distinguished um, uh, uh, panelists, um, uh, members of parliament and everybody. Um, before I start, I would like to find out moderator. I have two parts. I have one part of the ESC and African Union and then ESC and European Union. Should I handle one first and hand the another later or I go straight to everything? Go ahead. Straight. Everything. So I might maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, when you look at the structure of trade, between um, the ESC, the South African community countries, and the rest of the world, um, you'll notice that um, we do a lot of trade, export trade, especially with the region. We are exporting quite a lot uh, into the region, um, and then the commercial region, so to say. And then um, when it comes to imports, we import quite a lot from Asia, that's China and India. And uh, you, you also note that, um, yes, we do quite a lot of trade with the European Union, but over the years, considerably, there's been some decline here and there. I just want to give that uh, perspective. Before moving into um, what we could do to improve export trade from the ESC to the rest of the continent, to start with, during this region of uh, this, this moment of COVID, um, those who were organized in terms of e-trade, they were able to do quite a lot because they were able to communicate uh, uh, within the different countries or regions and they were able to, to sell and buy. But we have deficits in terms of, first of all, globally, a framework for e-trade. Okay, e-commerce. Uh, we have standalone uh, positions. And I think within the ESC, we are still grappling. We haven't yet um, sort of concretized how to handle this. And I think this will help us to do quite a lot of trade. That's point number one. Point number two, we need to solidify, consolidate the regional integration process that we have started. There are gaps here and there. Uh, but we need to do more of that. And of course, now the FCTA, we have uh, the Commissar ESC SADAC, what we call the tripartite of the, the I mean, this uh, about 26 countries. If, if these consolidate uh, the regional integration, breaking the barriers, uh, tariff barriers, breaking the non tariff barriers, and putting frameworks for easy flow of goods and services. I think regional integration is one of the things that we will need to really to consider to, uh, to improve on exports. Now, when you look at the kind of trade we do, like uh, the Secretary General did mention, um, it takes narrow patterns of trade. We depend on primary products and involve low levels of, low levels of uh, inter, which leads to low levels of inter-country um, uh, trade. You'll notice that we export raw uh, materials, not processed, if processed, not a lot has been added to that. So this limits our levels of diversification. We need to diversify to be able to break into um, other markets. The need for specialization to be able to for selling um, primary products or commodities, oil and gas alone is not sufficient. This is it's necessary, but not sufficient. So economic diversification is something that we need to consider seriously to be able to, to reach out 
to the middle markets to sell what others are selling in those uh, um, markets. Now, as you note, another point, as you note, um, right now, uh, the Ugandan armed forces are in the Congo, as we talk right now, trying to flush out the ADF. Now, with conflicts here and there, you are not likely to do quite a lot of trade. You have a problem in Somalia. Right now, we have a problem in Ethiopia. So, with the political tension, conflict, violence, it's likely to discourage um, uh, the ability of the region, East African community, to be able to trade and, um, and, and, and do more than what we are now doing. We need to deal with the conflict. Conflict is one of the biggest um, challenges. Then we have infrastructure problems. Sub-Saharan Africa has a lo lots of deficits in terms of infrastructure and the deficiencies make it very difficult for growth and productivity. And the transportation costs are really, 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 really high, um, extremely high. According to a UN um, Economic Commission for Africa report, only about 30% of African roads are paved as a consequence. And uh, uh, shipping a car from Japan to Abidjan will cost you about $1,500. But doing the same from Addis Ababa to Abidjan is $5,000. So infrastructure to enable movement is very critical, as you are aware. The colonial legacy left uh, us with the roads and rail lines from where raw materials are to the coast. But linking us internally to be able to trade is still um, a very big challenge. Um, of course, live alone trade facilitation facilities, all these are extremely important. So infrastructure is, um, I, I was told that one of the, the most expensive routes is, is Entebbe in Nairobi when you fly. Very expensive, very few kilometers, but very expensive. How would we bring this down? These are the areas that will uh, help us to increase. Then we have border issues. When you come, border customs environment issues uh, within the intra-African trade. The fees are high. Charges at those customs uh, points are quite high. Um, according to doing business report, um, some sub-Saharan Af sub Africa, where East Africa is, is the world's most expensive region to trade. Moving uh, across borders, it can be very expensive. Of course, quite a lot has been done, but there's more needed to be done. It takes sometimes more days. Now, in, 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 in East Africa, from Mombasa to Kampala, it used to be about 21 days. Now, it is four days or so, which is an improvement, but we, we need to move further than this to, to be able to, uh, to do trade. So border issues, uh, one border stop points, these are issues that need to be addressed uh, very seriously. Uh, at the continental level, of course, we now have the pass system, the payment system, what we refer to as Pan-African payment and settlement system. If I want to trade with a country in West Africa, I need dollars, I need euros, I need pounds to be able to buy. But this system, through the central banks is going to help us to sell and buy using our own currencies. I will sell whatever I'm selling to South Africa using Ugandan currency, and the South African will receive runs. If this system, which is being uh, piloted in West Africa right now and going to be implemented at the FCTA level, works out, this will really, really, really help uh, quite a lot. Then, in terms of the rules of origin, we are now negotiating at the FCTA level, um, the rules of origin. This, 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 I mean, they are critical. They determine the nationality of a product. How would we design the rules of origin when we are actually having a lot of intermediates in our production lines to be able not to um, uh, fail uh, uh, export trade? For example, the accumulation levels must be organized in such a way that they will encourage us to be able to, to sell because the rules of origin are actually possible. Without them being formulated so well, uh, we will not be able to perhaps uh, get what we want. They must factor in infant industries. At the same time, they must factor in uh, um, uh, uh, trade to be able to move. Like the Secretary General mentioned, we need to encourage investment, both domestic and foreign FDI flows. 
put in place sufficient rules and law consistent predictable macroeconomic uh, policies as a prerequisite to investment. Also, um, subscribe, we subscribe to rational conventions and institutions that protect investors. These have to be um, done in such a way that if I'm coming from Japan or from UK or from uh, European Union countries to invest in the ESC, I am protected. I have everything in place to be able to work. So this is yet an, another very important um, um, uh, area. Technology adoption, Our we have technology deficits. We need to do many things to work on that. There's a problem or an issue on intellectual property rights frameworks. Here they are, I think on the Kenya within the ESC has I think a lot to that effect. The others are still grappling. We haven't yet gotten to a level of using these to harness production and development of technology. So we need to institute frameworks for tech, to work on the technology deficits, promote technology transfer, incubation and adoption. That is another area that we need to think about. Um, then effective and timely addressing of non-tariff barriers. Within the ESC, we have the monitoring committees to handle non-tariff barriers. We even have a law that has been assented to by the heads of state. Now, these laws should be operationalized so that we don't get um, into issues of non-tariff barriers mutating, evolving, and changing from time to time. Same things, but appearing in different forms. This will also encourage trade both within and, um, and uh, outside <clears throat> the, the ESC. Now, we need to negotiate meaningful tariff reduction under the ongoing tariff schedules at the, uh, the FCTA level. This is extremely, extremely important because if we don't get that right, and I think the process going on, we are about 80 something percent through. This uh, is something that needs to be um, worked on extremely. And, 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 and I think there was a, um, an IMF report that talked of restrictive trade policies as one of the limitations to, 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 to trade uh, within uh, the region. The Secretary General talked about the deficits of industrialization. We have a very big deficit. You are not going to sell diversified without pursuing industrialization as a policy. Within the ESC, we have a strategy, we have um, um, a, a, a policy for industrialization, and then we have the national one. Just to give you an idea, when you look at our regional exports that are manufactured, it's only 18%. Uh, if you get an average from 2000 to 20, 2019, about 18% sub-Saharan Africa where we are. Yet when you go to Asia, it is about 72%. When you go to European Union, it is 70%. So for you to be able to trade, you need to industrialize. It's a must. And that's why our average value added is quite low, very low compared to the rest um, globally. Again, the Secretary General touched on something, which is the last point on, um, on Af East, Afri East African community and then the rest of Africa, how to uh, uh, increase trade, nurturing small scale sector. SMEs are the largest components of our businesses. Now, these ones are not sometimes in the mainstream um, uh, uh, formal sectors. So they are really struggling with a lot of problems. They drive the economies, they employ the people, but they are not within the mainstream. And they're operating alongside giant multinational corporations. So how do we bring these in the mainstream? What policies do we put in place? These are issues that need to be addressed. And finally on this, we have the third parties coming to the ESU to negotiate treaties with us. Uh, we have uh, had the USA expressing itself, Turkey and others, I just mentioned those two. Negotiating these third party treaties, we need a lot of thought. What do they mean for the regional integration that we have within the ESC? Are they adding on value? Are they coming to break it apart? What exactly are we going into? So this is something that because they come with what we call WTO plus clauses. I'll just give an example, dispute settlement mechanism. 
where uh, companies can sustain. These are not simple issues. We may take them lightly, but eventually you, you get one country with cases that amount billions of dollars of euros, ETC. There are issues of intellectual property rights. How do you deal with third parties that are coming? And I think to me, that's uh, something that, so these are my thoughts on how we can have uh, the ESC increase trade with the, the, the rest. Uh, Moderator, if you permit me, let me proceed to the European Union very quickly. I don't know whether I should proceed. Uh, my thoughts on the European Union. You can proceed, but we have to take into consideration the time. All uh, right, I'll be very here. fast. The time because we have to, to give also Jane Malunga the chance to, to come in, uh, and then maybe we have a, a, a joint discussion because there are already many questions in the chat, in the, in the Q and A um, pillar. But uh, so two minutes more on the EU, and then I go over to the next. Speaker. Okay, I'll, I'll move very fast. Um, on the EU, some of the points I've mentioned um, really do apply in a way, but a, a, a few things. Uh, one, um, the European Union has a trend called sh uh, shifting consumer preferences. There's a lot of, ch of changing dietary preferences. And then the issue of standards. For, for the East African community to be able to benefit from, the, from these trends and changes, there is need to build a capacity to comply. Whether internally, whether with external help, for you to be able to reach the European Union markets and benefit from them, the issue of standards, because of shifting consumer preferences, because of changing the actual preferences within the European Union and standards and regulations, there is a need to build capacity. That one, I'll leave it at that. Um, again, the other one is we have different uh, frameworks, not frameworks as such, but regimes. We have the EBA, everything but arms. Now, of course, we have the, um, the Economic Partnership Agreement and many other uh, 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 preferences that have been extended to the region. And sometimes this comes with a lot of challenges. Like uh, when Kenya said, I'm signing the EPAS, and Tanzania said, no, hold on, we are not signing. We need to find out what's going on here. Why don't we have one, why don't we harmonize and have one regime? Because responding to this different regime sometimes becomes uh, uh, pro problematic. Then the last point on this, perhaps, uh, is um, the impact of EU aid for trade. Can we have a more resource-based programming for this money so that we, we have value for money, for aid for trade, instead of just, if it's results-oriented, perhaps it will, uh, it will create more impact than uh, what, what, what it, uh, what, what's happening right now. I'll, I'll stop there for the time being, Perhaps when the questions come up, I'll be able to respond to them. But these are some of my thoughts on how we can uh, increase trade between the EU and East, East African community. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Isaac Shiniekwa, for was this very interesting, I would say very concrete and precise also um, um, view into the reality in the East African uh, region. Um, that leads me to, to Jane Nalunga, Executive Director of Serantini from Uganda. So maybe you can also look into these realities, give us additional picture or just stressing what has been said so that we are able then to go really into the discussion. I would have a lot of questions already now, but probably uh, there will arise among the participants of our webinar even more. Uh, Jane, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, um, Honorable Helmut, and good evening, uh, uh, comrades who are participating. Um, first of all, I would like also to appreciate 
the listening mode and especially the fact that the mode has been opened up to other actors uh, like the civil society uh, beyond the government officials. Um, it's true that we need to review and reassess the relationship uh, between the trade and investment relationship uh, between EU and Africa, given that EU is one of the, um, uh, the, the trading partners of Africa. So if we are to recover from the COVID pandemic, build resilience and also achieve a transformative development, if that can deliver the SDGs, we need to reassess the, the relationship. And I think the COVID pandemic also gives us um, uh, uh, an opportunity to dare to think differently, to assess the past uh, relations and also uh, to look at our policies. Um, uh, one, I, I, I think I need to emphasize the issue of the economic partnership agreements because this is uh, the principal trade policy instrument EU has for Africa. Um, and since, uh, as the Secretary General pointed out, that the negotiation started way back in 2002, 2002 uh, these negotiations have given a rise to a number of problems uh, for the regions but also for the CFTA, they are up. To, they will have challenges uh, for the CFTA, and I will go straight to the East African region, as uh, the Secretary General pointed out. At the current state today, Rwanda signed; they didn't ratify. The rest of the countries didn't sign. Uh, Kenya ratified, and now they are looking at. Um, implementing the EPA bilaterally. This is going to have an implication on the East African regional integration because we have a common C CET, a common external tariff. It's going to affect, for example, if you we want to, uh, to, 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 uh, to have regional value chains and Kenya is trading with the uh, EU, you know, it's going to affect uh, uh, the regional uh, uh, regional integration. Um, the issue which has been raised by uh, the Secretary General, I, I think it's really debatable, the issue around the variable geometry. And for us as civil society, we have been saying it's unfair for Africa uh, to destroy their regional integration using principles uh, using wrongly the principles which are in the treaty. The variable geometry, it's clear that it was put in place for internal, it was an internal mechanism to allow partner states uh, to, to, uh, as an integration block to implement integration projects at a different level, different speed internally, that Uganda, you can be able to take three years to implement a certain policy, a certain project, but it, it has never been meant for third parties and that's wrong. And we are using variable geometry to kill our own regional integration. To go back to the EPAs, um, the EPAs are going to affect the continental free trade agreement in two ways. It, they are destabilizing the regional economic groupings Yet the regional economic groupings are the building blocks of the CFTA. Then two, the EU is negotiating deeper EPAs. They have started with the uh, sub five countries, Comoro, uh, Mauritius, and all those countries. And when you look at the issues which have been put on table, which they are negotiating, these are issues of investment, uh, issues of intellectual property rights, digital trade. These are the issues which we are going to negotiate under the CFTA in the second phase. So that means that what EU is negotiating with the SF5 under the deeper EPA is going to circumscribe what we are going to negotiate as Africa in the CFTA. And for me, this is a big, big challenge. But we also find that the EU 
is negotiating with other countries on investment investment issues. So it's going to be a challenge for Africa. But there are also other challenges with the EPA, and that's why countries like Uganda and Tanzania didn't sign. For example, one, the very extensive liberalization, and that's uh, phasing out of a number of key trade policy tools, like export taxes. So I, I, I think, for one, I think it's really important that the EU reconsiders the economic partnership agreement as its principal tool. And it's not true. Last, uh, the other day when we are discussing this issue, uh, one of our uh, honorable member of parliament from the European Union said that it's African countries who are demanding to negotiate EPS with the EU. And for me, this I don't think it's true. We have seen how Kenya was frog marched into signing the EPS. They, Kenya was threatened with an increase in tariffs on their fish and flowers. So I, I think we need a, a fundamental restructuring because Africa today needs policy space to be able to put in place policies at domestic level, at regional level, and at continental level. Policies that would be able, can be able to help Africa to weather the post-COVID challenges. And EPAs are counter uh, to this. So specifically for the ESC region, I'm requesting that the EU should consider the ESC as an LDC region because all the five countries of the ESC are LDCs apart from Kenya. And in any case, when you look at Kenya's uh, parameters, human uh, development indicators, they, are, they also have their own challenges. So let the EU consider ESC as an LDC region, treat it as one region so that it can be able to preserve uh, to preserve its regional integration. And this has been a long-standing request by the EU, but also the LDC status to provide duty-free and quota-free market access can be extended to the entire Africa and with a single rules of origin so that we can be able to accumulate and be able to have continental and regional value chains. Uh, at the multilateral level, I'm requesting all the EU also to spearhead meaningful reforms at the WTO because we need a supportive global trading system. Today it isn't. We need to put on table back issues which are of interest to Africa. For example, issues around agriculture, issues of agriculture subsidy, issues of the special safeguard mechanisms so that we can be able to protect our agriculture. So uh, um, that's also another area which we, we need to, uh, to also consider. And back to the ESC, I think, and I, it's good the Secretary General is here, I think we need to, as a region, consider where we are in the global trading system. We need to maintain our unity. We don't need to go into variable geometries to discuss um, individual countries with other third parties. We need to increase our productive capacity. We need to promote uh, regional value chains. Uh, we need to reassess our agriculture and industrial tariffs. Because if we are talking about industrialization, we need to reassess that. We need also to be able to rethink our, our, our investment policies, both investment and trade policies. But I will concentrate on the investment policy. Beyond uh, attracting FDI, we need quality FDI. We need to rebalance the rights and obligations of the investors. We need to rebalance the rights of the investors, the people as communities, as workers, the rights of governments and the rights of, uh, of the environment. Because you find what we have today as um, 
investment policies, the rights and obligation are skewed. That all the rights go to the investors. They come in, they do what they want, they don't source locally, then they transfer what, what they, they want. So we need to review our invest, investment codes. And as ESC, we need to revive our East African investment code so that we can be able to cooperate and avoid the race to, uh, to, to, to the bottom. But again, here, we need policy space from the EU because the EU is already negotiating investment uh, 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 protocols with a number of African, African countries. But we also need to put issues of uh, human rights in our investment policies human rights are central you know the investors should provide decent jobs should source locally we should be talking about joint ventures so so that we can be able to strengthen our smes so uh chair i i, I think there is a lot which needs to be done but like I'm stressing the need for policy space to be able to have policies which come from below. For example, the investment policies, review investment policies at domestic level, at regional level, and then escalate them at the CFTA. That will require policy space from the European Union. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Jane Lalunga, for this also very precise view on the situation. Probably are coming back, uh, as you said, on the policy space we need. So I will turn the first question back to the uh, secretary uh, from Francesco Mari uh, from the German NGO Brot für die Welt. Um, uh, is Kenya's EPA ratification not harming the EAC integration in the future, also AFCTA development and um, building up, giving the EU and privileged access to EAC market and AFCFTA members without the possibility for Kenya neighbors to defend them from EU exports via the Kenya liberalization obligations. Shouldn't the EU freeze all EPA obligations at the same time giving all African countries free market access as it was in the case during the IPA negotiations from 2000 to 2008 with an um, WTO waiver? I mean, this is a question. And um, uh, linked to this is also a question also from Mari to um, uh, Isaac how the industrialization of the EAC with open borders to the EU for industrial goods via the Kenya EPR door will be possible. No country has industrialized without first having protected its industry. Look to the EU, for example, in the 60s and 70s in the car industry against Japanese and US imports with high tariffs still in force. Africa will do the same and compete with open borders to the EU. Is that really possible? So that are two questions already in the chat, uh, chat raised. I wanted to introduce in the beginning, but probably I could add one more question when we are speaking about the role issue maybe to both of you. Um, we have spoken a lot about the intra-regional trade as a necessity and a precondition for the development uh, uh, in the region, but, but probably that is true also for the other regions in Africa. And um, uh, Honorable uh, Secretary General of the AFCFTA Secretariat, Van um, uh, said on, on, on Monday that he is considering the AFCFTA not as a, as a trade agreement alone, but as a vehicle or as a tool for Africa's economic transformation. And that this importance of the economic transformation of, of Africa has to be viewed within the context of the continent's historical position 
in the global division of labor, largely as a producer and export of raw materials and natural resources. And that leads me to the question, how we are dealing in this whole relationship you have introduced today as ideas from different angles and the questions we are discussing in the European Union, how we are reshaping the value and the supply chains in a similar and parallel way. So how we are doing that. And um, to, uh, to Jane, you have spoken about the investments. I would add uh, the question, yes, money is needed. Investors need also a certain political stability if they are coming and if they want to invest money there. So who are, and you said you need the domestic, the, the increasing of domestic, to raising domestic money for, for, for being first in the domestic investment area, uh, successful and not becoming a subject for foreign direct investments, etc. So that is a, a complexity of the issues, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit more the, your your views on these questions before we are continuing the debate. Um, Dr. Matuki. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to start by appreciating presentations by Jane and Isaac uh, in the regard to the topic of the day. But uh, what is coming out here is that uh, the world is becoming smaller and we may need to reflect on the trade the agreement that uh, you know partners are getting into so that they reflect on the realities that are existing currently. And I think this is a, a challenge I would want to put to all of us, aware that the intention of EPAS was supposed to, to see how smoothly, you know, integrate the SCP countries into the world economy. And that was the initial intention of this. We need to ask ourselves whether we are still on track in that, in that, in that, in that aspect. And secondly, see, now with the issues of the global pandemics and so, how do we want to behave post-COVID? We want now to look at the realities because now we have known where we have strengths and where we have weaknesses and see whether we can renegotiate or possibly strengthen some of these trade agreements so that they, they give a proper reflection. I, I think that, that's my initial thinking. But to the question that is being raised on uh, ratifying EPAS is not arming regional integration. It is very unfortunate that the partner states of the East African community are categorized differently when we come to the EPAS. Some as LDCs and others are developing. And I want to agree with the speaker that if we were categorized as the same, possibly that would have given a very good starting point as we try to see how it works. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And that is why when Kenya decided to ratify and possibly start negotiating on APAS, it was because uh, a number of people, citizens of East Africa from that particular country were losing jobs because aware of most of the things that were going to the EU market are cut flower, you know, ETC, things that are horticulture, which is labor, labor intensive. And therefore, most of the people in Kenya was not to sign this thing to the meant that the entire, you know, you know, population that is working in those sectors is affected. And also in terms of, uh, in terms of incomes. And therefore, that is why on one side, it was a very a tight, uh, you know, spot. How do we? How does Kenya signing EPAS mean to the PSC integration? But if not signing, how does it affect the population? And that is why, in the wisdom of the heads of state, the summit felt: Why can't we allow variable geometry so that the countries that are ready, they can proceed? In any case, they are not categorized as the same. Since uh, Kenya is categorized as a developing, while others are LDCs, meaning that they are not losing anything, they can still access the market, you know, under EPA, everything but arms. But Kenya cannot access that, and that was basically the argument. But what we are doing at the Secretariat is we are trying to come up with a framework that would possibly see and ensure that all the partner states of the EAC indeed, indeed negotiate all of us together and get on board 
on this uh, on this epos, on this epos. and these are the realities on whether it is going to affect the integration agenda and whether it is going to affect the bigger SFTA uh, agenda and whether the European products and services will be accessing you know market for in East Africa using Kenya I think that is a, a time to tell but the reality of the matter is that we are all geared towards one increasing intra esc trade trade among the partners of the esc trying to of course uh, you know strengthen the manufacturing capacity so that because of the value addition and see how we could uh, uh, you know take advantage of the of that in terms of the supply chains the value chains so it, it is a yes or no no, not to the extent that I don't think it is going to affect integration because the ESC integration is uh, so many parameters and the commitment and the political goodwill is very key in this. And I think there is that commitment. So I want to allay fears by, by the person who has raised the question on whether uh, the ESC integration is affected, whether SCFT is affected. I don't think that should be the case. What we try to as partners, EU, East Africa, Africa, see how we can relook at the efforts and see how we can even strengthen it more by making it more flexible so that it can respond to the current issues that we are facing. On the issues of, um, of uh, whether we should then allow EU to freeze EPA obligation and give free access to African goods directly. I think it was that I said the initial objective of EPA was to see how to integrate the SCP countries into the world market. And therefore, I don't know whether by freezing, but whether he would be keen to do that. However, my, my thinking is that we need to have you know, a middle ground where we need to really come on the ground, on the table, and see now the realities as they were and see how to possibly strengthen and even make sure that EPA is of, is, of, is of quality. Of course, the issues of open skies and the issues of border issues, those are things that that's work in progress. Uh, but I must appreciate that um, the world is moving very fast, it's dynamic, we need to respond to the challenges that the world is facing. As leaders, we need to, we need to go beyond listening and action, respond to what the needs of the citizens are, and that way they want they want to move freely. They want to sell their goods freely in the world. They want to make sure that they get value and put money in their pockets, and that would be possible if we make business environments uh, easier. And of course, uh, you know, all the bureaucracies that exist try as much as possible strengthen the private and public sector, you know, engagements so that we we make. Uh, the world easy and respond to the needs of the citizens. That's what I would want to say in response to the question that was raised. I'm not very sure whether uh, Honorable shows I, I picked or answered part of your query. Possibly the next speaker could be able to do that. But if I, if you feel I should, yes, I'll be ready. Yeah, maybe we are giving now the floor to, to Dr. Isaac. Um, first, and then we so that we have really a debate. So, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just respond to two things. Uh, the Secretary General has done quite well on that. <clears throat> there was a question asked me how we deal with the climate protection, um, vis a vis our trade policy. Um, this is what I would think when we're developing developing uh, trade policies, they should take into consideration um, the, protection, uh, the protection of the environment, the protection uh, of things related to uh, what causes climate change. This should be enshrined, this should be embedded in our trade policies. It is like we have been doing gender mainstreaming in many policies. We need to think through how to make uh, climate issues part of the trade policies that we develop so that uh, effluents and emissions do not destroy so that economic growth does not sacrifice the environment basically that's what i can say about that and then the second one there was a question on um 
uh, you cannot industrialize um, unless you have these high tariffs to be able to protect indeed. At the ESC level, we have the common external tariff with a structure uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, finished products coming in at senior rate. We are, we are still reviewing, we should have had one by maybe 2018. And then there are intermediate products. And then there are sensitive products, things we consider very sensitive in the region. These would go for high tariffs to be able to protect. And I think this can be addressed using the common external uh, uh, tariff structure. Once it is thought through very carefully, you look at the industry that you want to develop and you protect those, especially those that can help you build. Then the other way is also to attract what is being produced elsewhere and being sold within the region. We produce within the region, attract investors to move in, to be able to produce. Uh, we are building in Uganda, the, um, and I think the whole ESC, the iron and steel industry. And uh, it is slowly by slowly building up. Now this one needs to be protected, but at the same time we need to get in investors to be able to invest within. So those are two ways to attract, at, at a level when there's a lot of liberalization going in global. Liberalization is the one, it's, it's, it's the one. You, you cannot put very high terms for everything. Just get some and, and it should not be permanent. Once you put tariffs to protect an industry, this should not go on forever. There must be sunset closes therein. If it's not viable, then you leave it out. So I would think the common external tariff structure should be able to help us deal with this. Thank you, uh, moderate chairman. Thank you. Maybe I can add one point from my point of view before I give the floor to Jane. Maybe you can answer to that as well. Probably you have seen that in the EU, we are currently negotiating a due diligence legislation. And we are also discussing very hardly um, uh, responsible business conduct, obliging corporations, enterprises, bigger and smaller ones, to take into consideration in the whole supply chain, human rights, employment issues, environmental criteria, and as I, I have seen in the chat, there is also the question for how to, how to deal more with a, with a perspective for young people who are jobless, for how, how we can make women come into the business sector, how they can have their own ability to take part in the development. So these aspects are, of course, connected always with legislative acts or with framing how the economic uh, policies have to be carried out. So that is a huge debate we have here in the parliament. And I also want to add that a huge part or a direction of my report will of course deal with the SDGs. So we have nine years left to reach 2030, the implementation of the SDGs. So the climate problem and the trade policies and the production policy and the production abilities of the country, uh, of the economies also as the African continent, they are interlinked. So the problem is how we are realizing that we are taking responsibility there where we are in responsibility to frame the political and the economic, how to say, it, reality, taking this into consideration. So the responsibility is of course also within the EAC, within the Western, um, uh, Western Africa and Southern parts of Africa and in Northern part and in the European Union. And of course, also globally, you have the competition from Chinese, American and other, and British, uh, which not any longer uh, European Union, um, 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 economic stakeholders who are playing all at the African continent. So the question is and that, uh, is linked partly to the investment issue, Jane. Maybe you can come in on that, but that would be also a question for the for the general secretary once more. Are you are you dealing in your in your positioning of the EAC towards the AFCFTA and, 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 and rethinking what does it mean for shaping that? Thank you. 
Jane, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable. Um, I just wanted to um, respond to um, three critical issues. One is the issue of Africa's integration into the global economy. And this is what um, usually we, we are told that Africa should be integrated in the global economy. And that was one of the objectives of the EPA. But the most important issue is the nature of the integration. Africa has been integrated and is integrated as a supply of raw materials and cheap labor. You know, I, I, I think in all our discussion, we need to ensure that we change that nature of integration from commodity suppliers to value-added suppliers. So we need to reassess and see our relationship with, Af uh, with Europe. What needs to be changed to change so that almost and Isaac, you are good at these figures. I don't know whether we're exporting almost 70% or 90% of our commodities to Europe as raw commodities. So how do we change that? You know, for me, that's critical that the relationship between Africa and Europe has to change that nature of integration into, into the global the global economy. We need to ensure that we export value-added products so that we create jobs for the young people and to ensure that the rural communities get value for money for their products. Two, uh, the issue of uh, the EPAs, um, sorry, uh, Secretary General, to come back on this issue. And the fact that you want other uh, ES members to come on board. For me, I think this would be unfair uh, for the other members of the East African community because by that time they rejected signing the EPS or when they, there was a stalemate, there were critical issues which the partner states raised regarding the EPS. Those issues up to today haven't been agreed on, haven't been discussed, haven't been addressed by the EU. That Kenya signed and ratified the EPAs, not because those issues were addressed, but because of the stick, as you said, they increased tariffs. And I remember when you, if you look at our, there's a statement which is on our website at Seatini, we calculated how much Kenya was going to lose just in flower exports alone and the jobs which were to be lost. So Kenya took that step. Kenya was caught up between a rock and a hard place, you know, because they needed the market access to the European Union. And this is why we are saying, we are requesting that EU shouldn't put countries in such untenable position. It shouldn't. If EU is really committed to regional integration, to helping Africa, to do whatever, all those very nice words, you walk that talk. Let EU walk that talk. Let Kenya be the entire East African region be considered an LDC group. And that's why you see we are we, we, we are looking at variable geometry and we said now we, this is variable geometry, but it isn't true. It's just that we are caught up in that tenable uh, situation. Uh, lastly, Chair, the issue of, um, uh, the issue of uh, inclusive trade and investment policy. As we move uh, to the post COVID recovery, as you know, all our economies have been battered, but our economies as poor countries have been battered even more. And within those economies, the poor, the poor, the rural women, the youth in the rural areas, in the slum areas in the city, they, 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 their situation is really, really untenable. So, so when we are reassessing the trade and investment policies, we need to put those people 
into consideration. And that's why it's really important to rethink all our trade policies, all our investment policies, but also to rethink the CFTA. When you look at the CFTA, we started the CFTA before the COVID pandemic. And the whole issue was about liberalization. It's almost 90% outright liberalization. And we are leaving just the protection part, just 3%. You know, is this fair? Is this tenable? Can we be able to industrialize? I have looked at our list of liberalization in Uganda, and I doubt, maybe Isaac, that you are the economist, you need to look at it and see whether we can be able to industrialize, we can be able to create jobs and also be able to create regional value chains. So for me, I think we need to go back on the drawing board when it comes to the CFTA, when it comes to investment policies, and when it comes to our relationship between Africa and the European Union. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you, you come in or Dr. Matuki first. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on one thing. Uh, just adding to what um, Jane said regarding industrialization and the tariffs. So we lost you, I think. Steve. Yeah. Oh, do you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Now we, oh, yes, now we hear you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I was just saying, uh, for us to be able to competitively participate in the global economy, one, we need to industrialize. We are not going to run away from that. We are not going to be perpetual suppliers or participants in the global value chains at the lowest level. No. This has to change, and this will come through adoption of the right policies that have to do with, first of all, the tariff structures, of course, the investment, etc. So like she did comment, as we liberalize, we need to think carefully. Over-liberalization is not going to help us because we shall be flooded with the products. That will totally wipe out what we are trying to do. So um, my, 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 very, my very, very uh, ardent, a comment on this is one, we need to industrialize. We can't run away from it. How do we industrialize is by adoption of the right policies, including the common external tariff structures that will support and the rules of origin that will support industrialization. Like uh, my colleagues have said, the economic partnership agreement, the EPAS, um, we are likely, or we are likely, as perceived by some individuals, not even in the countries within the ESC, as likely to de-industrialize, likely not support industrialization. So as the European Union, I think you need to think very carefully about this so that perhaps um, we can move on and overcome the very geometry debate that's going on. Honestly speaking, analysis I was involved in this thing, analysis were done, and there was likely to be challenges when we implement them, the economic partnership structures and schedules as they were. So these are things to consider if really the European Union would want African continent to industrialize. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Isaac. And immediately the floor to Dr. Matuki. As time is running, we have only some minutes yeah. left. Yeah, true, true. I don't have much to say, but I want to, as I conclude, to say the European Union may want to consider to put a special fund for building capacities, especially in the areas of trade, 
and investment for African countries and particularly East Africa, so that these countries can come to a level where they could be possibly be able to sit down and negotiate and do business with the with EU. And that is reality. I think we for that fund, build capacity of the private sector investment on businesses within East Africa. Literally ensure that even the policy framework that is put in place, it is pro business for East Africa. Because once East Africa grows in terms of business, this is all good for Europe. That's what I would want to say. But I think it's the high time we move from watching and listening to action. And that is what is expected of us. I thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to take uh, the last minutes to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who is a certain co-host for our today's meeting. And without them, it wouldn't have been possible to meet and to, to discuss very important questions. I would also encourage all of you to send me your thoughts in writing by email. Also those who have maybe not spoken, but have a certain reflections and an idea from participants from African continent to send uh, some reflections on that to me, because then we can consider it while drafting the report about the future EU-Africa trade and investment relations. I want to thank the interpreters very much for, for making it possible that we have such a conversation together. And finally, um, I guess there is a lot of ideas, problems, proposals, and concerns put on the table this evening. And uh, we have a lot to do, and we have to think about the, the problems you raised the incentives you made. And um, um, I've felt it necessary to continue such a, a debate and a discussion among us because we have not solved yet the problems, but by putting the problems on the table, by analyzing where we are, we are enabling us to act, uh, General Secretary, uh, what you have, your, your call, your demand to us, and so let's stay in a closer contact on that issue. Um, so I hope um, uh, with this webinar, we have opened an interesting series. Please be invited also to the next um, um, uh, webinar, part two, that is West Africa on the coming, um, incoming Wednesday, February the 2nd from 6 to uh, 7.30 again, Brussels time. Uh, we have interesting guests there um, and um, uh, I think the East Africans with your experience of a really, a really intra-regional comprehensive cooperation could be a challenge to the West African countries and if we are discussing all these regional parts under the umbrella of the incoming or in the negotiated but still further developed to be developed uh, AFCFTA. So, and this uh, brings me to the conclusion of this evening. Thank you all for being with us. I want to thank once more to the estimated panelists, um, Dr. Peter Matuki, uh, Dr. Isaac Chenyekwa, and uh, Dr. Jane Nalunga for giving insights uh, and stuff for this, for the for the poor Europeans who have to to learn a. a a lot of lessons from Africa. Thank you very much.